board and welcome everybody to the Public Health Law Center's webinar, Home is Where the Health is, HUD's Rule Restricting Smoking in Public Housing. In this webinar, we'll be discussing a rule issued by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, that will restrict smoking in public housing. And this is a part of our regular webinar series. Uh, as Ward mentioned, archived recordings of our webinars, as well as a schedule of future webinars, can be found on our website, www.publichealthlawcenter.org. And this webinar should last about an hour. Um, I'm Mike Freiberg. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium within the Public Health Law Center. And before going on, I wanted to tell you a bit about the Public Health Law Center. Uh, the Public Health Law Center helps create communities where everyone can be healthy. We empower our partners to transform their environments by eliminating commercial tobacco, promoting healthy food, and encouraging active lifestyles. Because we provide legal and strategic support to so many local and state health departments, health advisory organizations, attorneys working on public health issues, and community coalitions around the country, we're helping to drive many of the nation's cutting edge public health initiatives. We believe that our legal knowledge can help bring justice to public health as we support our partners in reducing health disparities. When all people are healthier, the communities they live in are happier, safer, and more vibrant places. Founded in 2000, the center is located at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now here is what we'll talk about in this webinar. Um, I'm honored to have a distinguished group of speakers for this webinar. First, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, Peter Ashley, and Leroy Ferguson from HUD will discuss the HUD rule. Lourdes M. Castro Ramirez serves as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, leading the Office of Public and Indian Housing at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. In this capacity, she manages a budget of more than $26 billion and leads a team of 1,300 professional employees nationwide who oversee and support 4,000 public housing authorities and 566 Native American communities to provide safe and quality affordable housing and create opportunities for resident self-sufficiency and improved quality of life for 3.2 million households. Ms. Castro Ramirez's career in affordable housing and community development began two decades ago in Ventura, California as a community planner. In that role, she organized resident leadership and community building initiatives in several low-income rural and urban neighborhoods. From there, Ms. Castro Ramirez joined the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, first as the director for the Jobs Plus demonstration and later as director of the Housing Choice Voucher Program, assisting more than 50,000 low-income families. In early 2009, Ms. Castro Ramirez was tapped to be the president and CEO for the San Antonio Housing Authority. Managing an operating budget of $186 million with real estate assets valued at more than $500 million, Ms. Castro Ramirez successfully directed a team of 525 employees to provide housing assistance to over 65,000 children, adults, and senior citizens. Under her leadership, the San Antonio Housing Authority became known for its innovations in education, workforce development, affordable housing preservation, and neighborhood revitalization. Ms. Castro Ramirez received both her MA in Urban Planning and BA in Political Science and Chicano and Chicana Studies from the University of California, Los Angeles. She also completed an executive finance course at Harvard Business School. Ms. Castro Ramirez is married to Jorge Ramirez, and together they have three children, Jorge, Nicolas, and Natalia. Jorge and Lourdes actively participate in raising awareness about childhood cancer by coordinating an annual Kick Cancer Soccer Camp in memory of their son, Nicolas, who lost his battle to cancer in 2012 at the age of 11. Peter Ashley directs the Policy and Standards Division within the HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control in Healthy Homes. The division manages the award of grants and contracts for research on residential hazard assessment and control methods, contributes to policy development, and develops and implements special initiatives. He received a Doctor of Public Health and Environmental Health from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and a Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan. Previous professional experience includes serving as an environmental toxicologist and director of the Division of Environmental Health Assessment for the Maryland Department of the Environment and as a toxicologist for a private consulting firm. He also served as a teacher and a trainer for the U.S. Peace Corps. Leroy Ferguson was something of a late addition to the lineup here, so I apologize 
for not having his full biography or a picture of him to go up on the slide here. He is the Housing Program Specialist in the Management and Occupancy Division of the Office of Public Housing Programs at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and we are extremely grateful that Mr. Ferguson was able to participate in this webinar. Eric Oberdorfer will then discuss implementation for public housing authorities. Eric is the Policy Advisor for Public and Affordable Housing at the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, or NARO. He is responsible for a policy portfolio that includes the Federal Public Housing Program and other affordable housing programs. This requires researching, analyzing, and formulating recommendations related to regulations and legislation involving federal rental assistance programs, including, but not limited to, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Public Housing Program. Along with the policy and program development team, Eric is responsible for refining and advancing NARO's legislative and regulatory agenda. Prior, Eric was a research associate at the Housing Assistance Council. At the Housing Assistance Council, he worked on a variety of projects and reports that focused on topics related to rural affordable housing. His previous experience also includes working with affordable housing at the Department of Neighborhoods in Anchorage, Alaska, as well as the City of Vancouver and BC Housing in Vancouver, British Columbia. Eric has a BA in Geography and International Development from the University of Washington in Seattle and an MA in Community and Regional Planning from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Finally, I will briefly discuss ways public housing authorities can go beyond the requirements of the HUD rule before we turn to a question and answer session that I will be moderating. So with that, I will now turn it over to Lourdes Castro Ramirez to discuss the rule itself. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and thanks to the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium, as well, of course, um, thanks to the Public Health Law Center for having us today. It's been a busy year here at HUD, and we are so fortunate to work under Secretary Castro, who is a fierce proponent for HUD's final rule to make all public housing smoke-free. The health and the safety of our residents is important, and with the Secretary's support, we were able to prioritize this new rule. I know that I'm preaching to the choir when I say that housing and public health go hand in hand to promote safe and healthy communities. The smoke-free rule builds on the work of 670 public housing agencies that are, are already smoke-free. This represents nearly 250,000 public housing units. And when the rule gets uh, fully implemented, the smoke-free rule will improve the health of over 2 million residents living in public housing including over 760,000 children. In addition to this, uh, the final rule will reduce smoke-related maintenance costs and lower the risk of exposure to secondhand smoke. Public housing agencies will benefit from decreased maintenance and unit turnover costs and a significant reduction in the risk of catastrophic and fatal fires. Specifically, smoking is the leading cause of fire-related deaths in multifamily buildings. Every year, over 100,000 fires are caused by smoking, resulting in the loss of more than 500 lives and over $500 million in direct property damage. But beyond the cost, I want to underscore the health benefits. As many of you know, the Surgeon General has reported that there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand tobacco smoke. Smoke doesn't stop at the doorways. It goes through the cracks, it goes along electrical and plumbing lines and through air vents. It also travels to common areas such as hallways and lobbies, which, as many of you know, are already in many cases designated as non-smoking areas and buildings. So eliminating smoking indoors is the only way to fully protect both non-smoking residents and staff from exposure to secondhand smoke and, asso and the associated healthcare costs. According to a 2014 CDC study published in Preventing Chronic Disease, prohibiting smoking in all government subsidized housing in the United States, including public housing, would save an estimated $500 million per year in healthcare and housing related costs. That's huge, that's incredible. Those are dollars that can go back into housing more families. But let me talk to you about the mechanics of the rule. During the rulemaking process, HUD received well over 1,000 comments from public housing agencies, from healthcare partners, and from a number of stakeholders. We worked to create the rule that would 
take into account the feedback and also would allow the public housing agencies to have flexibility when enforcing these policies. As we know that not all public housing agencies are alike, we wanted to ensure that we were also building on the best practices of the housing authorities that have already implemented smoke-free rules. The policy prohibits tobacco products, including cigars, cigarettes, pipes, and hookahs, in all units, in all common areas, in all the administrative offices, and up to 25 feet away from all buildings. As many of you know, the rule was posted in the Federal Register on December the 5th, and it becomes effective on February the 3rd of 2017. Now, public housing agencies will have 18 months to fully implement the policy. As was mentioned by Mike earlier, prior to my service at HUD, I was the Executive Director of the San Antonio Housing Authority. And during my tenure with the Housing Authority, we went smoke-free. And I can honestly say that we would not have been as successful in implementing a smoke-free policy without the support of residents, without the engagement of the local government and local officials, and without the support and engagement of health partners. In my experience, I found that many residents and community partners were eager for this change and became our strongest advocates. We learned that in order to have a smooth implementation of a smoke-free policy, it is critical to have the full participation of residents. As you know, we need your support in providing technical assistance, access to health and cessation resources, and contacts for the public housing agencies to address specific populations, such as elderly residents or residents that have health issues. HUD is developing tools for PHAs and residents, including a step-by-step -step guidebook, a recommended implementation timeline, and access to partner resources, including cessation programs. These resources can be obtained through the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. And let me share with you the webpage. You can access these resources by going to healthyhomes.hud.gov. Again, healthyhomes.hud.gov. Finally, I want to thank you all very much for your interest and support in promoting health and in improving the life of millions of people across um, the United States. Thanks to all of our partners in the health and housing community for collaborating on this effort. Working together, we can build healthier communities. And now I'd like to turn it over to Peter Ashley from the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes, who will provide additional information. Thank you very much, Lourdes. Uh, it's uh, great to be with you all today. And uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the uh, Public Health Law Center and uh, Mike for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about uh, our smoke-free housing initiative um, that has uh, led up to the uh, publishing of the, the rule uh, to give you a little, uh, you know, a background and context. Um, this slide just uh, summarizes some of uh, the milestone dates uh, in our smoke-free housing initiative. Um, starting in 2009, um, our Office of Public and Indian Housing um, issued a notice encouraging housing authorities to adopt um, smoke-free measures in at least some of their um, properties, some of their buildings. Uh, this was followed in 2010 uh, by our Office of Housing um, publishing a similar notice um, that targeted um, privately owned HUD-assisted housing. Uh, you'll hear it referred to as uh, project-based Section 8 housing, also encouraging them to adopt um, smoke-free policies. Um, and over the years, uh, last few years, we've also um, published guidance uh, to help those that wanted to uh, go smoke-free uh, we published a Federal Register Notice in 2012, soliciting feedback on the initiative. Um, and then uh, 2015 is when we published the uh, proposed rule, and it's just recently uh, becoming final. On December 5th, uh, the final rule was published. 
This um, slide shows the uh, uh, cover of the most recent guidance that we've uh, published. Um, and it uh, is really uh, public and assisted housing, but it's got useful information um, for market rate uh, housing providers as well. Um, one unique aspect of this guidance is uh, uh, summaries of, of uh, interviews with uh, nine housing uh, managers adopted uh, smoke free policies um, in which they talk about um, some of the lessons learned in, in doing this. So uh, if you haven't looked at this, uh, I'd really urge you to uh, to pull it up from our website and, and take a look uh, because I think it, it does have a lot of good information in it. Uh, the appendix includes uh, copies of the notices and a summary of the responses that we got to the um, 2012 Federal Register notice. Um, so if you haven't, uh, take a look at this. Um, in uh, 2012, I believe it was, we also um, published what we call smoke-free housing toolkits targeting uh, both uh, residents and uh, managers, uh, so that those have uh, useful information in them as well. Um, this figure just shows um, uh, our tracking of uh, PHAs, uh, pub public housing agencies that have voluntarily adopted smoke-free policies starting in uh, 2011. Um, we know that uh, even before the notice was published, um, there were uh, there were PHAs that adopted uh, smoke-free housing policies. And uh, I, I think from what I've seen, that's largely from the work of advocates in, in those communities that uh, I know they've had a lot to do with, uh, with work and, and working with PHAs in their communities and, um, and promoting this, this concept and uh, getting them to adopt um, smoke-free policies. Um, you can see that we've kind of leveled out uh, recently at a little over six, 600 and uh, it's 676. Uh, this is not an official count. It's uh, based on intelligence gathering by uh, primarily uh, our Healthy Homes um, field staff. But we think it's a pretty good uh, estimate, you know, using uh, uh, what they can find from websites, um, media announcements, um, et cetera. We don't uh, right now have a, a means to uh, officially track uh, adoption in a central database. Uh, that, that might change, uh, but um, right now this is a, an unofficial estimate. So the, that, that uh, total represents about 21% of all uh, PHAs, um, about 3,200 PHAs that uh, manage, uh, you know, conventional um, public housing. So it's, um, you know, it's been, uh, a pretty uh, successful effort, I believe, in, in this uh, promotion of voluntary adoption. We know on the uh, uh, privately owned housing side, the Section 8 side, we've had um, uh, fair adoption as well. We just don't have an, an estimate uh, on that side. Um, this breaks down uh, the percentage of uh, public housing agencies by HUD region uh, that have adopted smoke-free policies. Um, just a caution here that um, this is um, the percentage, percentages are of the total agency, public housing agencies in those regions, and it doesn't reflect the population of residents uh, in those regions. Region two includes uh, New York, um, New York City, the largest uh, housing authority in the in the country. Uh, so, if we, it would be a it'd be a different graph if it was based on um, resident population. Uh, but you can see um, some patterns if you look at Region One and Ten. So, uh, New England and uh, you know the Northwest. Um, you can see that we had uh, we've had the highest percentage. Uh, of PHAs adopting uh, smog free policies at uh, 65 to 74 uh, percent, whereas uh, regions four and six have the lowest uh, percentage of adoption at around seven percent. Uh, so region four sent uh, in the southwest uh, centered around um, Atlanta, region six uh, farther west uh, centered centered around um, 
well, the uh, HUD field office uh, is in, um, let's see, where is the HUD field office? Uh, that's Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Um, it gives you a sense where um, uh, maybe some more efforts are needed in, uh, in outreach to uh, PHAs. Uh, you know, we believe these regions where we had uh, lower adoption uh, are certainly, um, you know, targets for, um, you know, greater outreach and assistance to uh, those, um, those PHAs. Uh, this map just um, shows you uh, the regions, uh, the HUD regions, and you can see um, uh, the regions that I just mentioned, um, four and six, um, at the bottom um, of, of the map, so the uh, southeast and uh, uh, the region that includes Texas, so Oklahoma, New Mexico, et cetera. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about um, our work with the federal partners. Um, we're uh, really relying on them and we've, uh, We've had um, some great um, assistance from them um, to date in implementing, uh, you know, the, um, the initiative. And now uh, we're going to rely on them further in, um, in the rollout um, of the, uh, the new rule. Um, as Lorda said, uh, especially, uh, we're especially interested in uh, getting assistance from um, federal partners in um, tobacco control organizations, uh, health departments, et cetera, in targeting uh, smoking cessation for um, residents of uh, public housing. Uh, of course, the rule doesn't require them to quit smoking, uh, but we know that um, a lot of smokers um, do want to quit, and uh, the rule might be uh, provide good incentive for uh, current smokers to um, make a quit attempt, and we know that it will also uh, reduce the amount of smoking um, for those who do not quit. Um, this, this slide um, just highlights um, uh, the, the role of the um, health centers, federally qualified um, health centers uh, funded through, um, through HRSA um, in um, providing a cessation support uh, to residents. Um, a, li a little over 100 of these health centers um, have, uh, have received um, public housing primary care grants from HRSA. Uh, they serve about 500,000 residents. Um, and additional clinics uh, serve about um, a million um, public housing residents, bringing the total up to about 1.5 million. Um, we've worked some with, uh, with a company called North American Management out of um, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, they have a cooperative agreement with HRSA uh, to support um, uh, the grantees that are working with uh, public housing residents through the National Center for Health in Public Housing. Um, they've um, held a, a webinar on this um, topic. They, they've made presentations at uh, meetings and uh, plan um, for you know, future outreach as well. Um, and in, in talking with them, um, you know, they've mentioned that they see the rule as a, an opportunity to really um, kind of reinvigorate um, their um, the clinic's efforts um, in um, in ses promoting cessation um, to the um, to their patients. So uh, it's a great opportunity uh, for those um, of you on the call who are, are interested in, in working with uh, with these clinics. So I really encourage you to uh, uh, to make contact with them and um, and see how you can and help as well as uh, direct contact with housing authorities. I also wanted to mention CDC. Uh, they've been tr uh, tremendously helpful to us. Um, uh, their Office of Smoking, um, it's Office of On Smoking and, and Health um, has provided a, a lot of assistance. Uh, they um, fund the, the National Tobacco Control Program uh, Network um, uh, that includes uh, the health departments in all the states and territories uh, fund them to um, to work on tobacco control, and they've encouraged them to uh, uh, to outreach to uh, public uh, housing authorities in their in their states and territories, and uh, the types of uh, assistance uh, that they can provide is uh, you know is education on the important the importance of smoke-free policies. 
such as the, the dangers of second, secondhand smoke exposure, um, providing information on smoke and cessation resources and best practices, you know, for working with, uh, with vulnerable populations. And they can also help uh, link, link PHAs with, um, with uh, clinics and other uh, medical care providers. Um, so this is a, you know, a great uh, resource as well. And, um, you know, we look forward to, um, to work, continuing our work with CDC. And uh, these uh, grantees also represent uh, an opportunity for those of you on the call, uh, you know, a partnering uh, opportunity. So uh, would really encourage you uh, again to, to reach out. Uh, one, you know, one, um, one thing that I think is important that, uh, you know, I've noticed is, uh, you know, some residents and also management don't really understand that uh, that smoking uh, in a multifamily building um, can affect non-smokers in other units. You know, the fact that uh, secondhand smoke travels between units and uh, there's no safe level of exposure. Um, I, I, I think that's really important um, information uh, and I think it can help um, smokers um, decide to be compliant with the, with the rules if they understand that their actions affect uh, others as well and not just in their units. Um, I just wanted to really briefly mention that we're funding our research on smoke-free housing both in the privately owned assisted housing stock and uh, one in um, Virginia that's working with um, public housing in Norfolk, Virginia uh, to assess um, implementation of uh, smoke free policies there and at San Diego State um, they're conducting research on uh, third hand smoke and uh, how to uh, best clean third hand smoke from uh, residue from um, from units um, it takes about three years for these grants to be completed um, but I wanted to give you all a heads up so uh, we'll, we'll get the word out when they have findings we're hoping that um, these findings can uh, help develop uh, best practices. So I'd like to now turn the webinar over to uh, my colleague in public housing, uh, Leroy Ferguson. Thank you, Peter. Um, I briefly want to go over a couple of steps that public housing authorities will be required uh, to adhere to uh, before implementing the uh, smoke-free policies. Uh, first, I want to talk about implementation. Uh, public housing authorities will be required to uh, amend their PHA plans. Uh, PHA plans are basically uh, plans that spell out what a PHA will do and how it will accomplish its mission. Uh, that's very similar to what the MTW agency will have to do as well. Uh, although MTW agencies don't have PHA plans, they do have uh, MTW plans, uh, which basically, will, again, will spell out uh, how they will accomplish their mission for the, for the year. Uh, that the PHA uh, submits those uh, plans. Um, PHAs will also have to uh, amend their leases with the public housing residents. The lease is the enforcement mechanism, uh, and all public housing residents uh, will have to uh, sign the amendment uh, indicating they are aware that uh, all public housing properties will be smoke-free. Uh, and that includes annual leases, automatic leases, and the uh, biannual leases. Uh, public housing authorities uh, will have flexibility to somewhat tailor their public uh, smoke-free policies to their interests. Uh, we do know that uh, public housing authorities are different throughout the country, uh, and one, one basically one size fit all may not fit uh, for one PHA. So we do allow them flexibility in uh, drafting and crafting their uh, smoke-free policies. However, uh, those policies must be within the parameters of the smoke-free rule. Uh, they can be stricter, uh, but we uh, want PHA to be mindful that uh, not to be too restrictive uh, in assigning their uh, PHA policies because uh, it may be hard to uh, uh, abide by those uh, stricter rules. Uh, again, um, as far as lease enforcement is concerned, smoking violations will basically be the same way as any other lease violation. Um, Public Housing Authority residents will be aware of what those violations will be spelled out in the lease. Uh, and it's also uh, violations will be treated just like any other vi lease violation uh, that a resident may incur. Uh, we encourage public housing authorities to uh, implement graduated enforcement mechanisms. Uh, basically, uh, 
public housing doesn't have any one strike per se rule for smoking. Uh, we only have one strike, one strike, uh, one rule for one strike, and that is uh, the use and the manufacture of met methamphetamines. Uh, so uh, public housing authorities cannot treat uh, smoke-free violations as a one strike and you're out violation. Again, we encourage public housing authorities to uh, uh, craft up uh, graduated enforcement mechanisms that may include uh, verbal warnings, written warnings, counseling, and as such. And the last uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, reasonable accommodations. We have heard uh, through public comments uh, that there may, there may be some uh, reasonable accommodation requests that come through the, uh, from residents. Uh, we want everybody to know that we will consider those reasonable accommodations on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so if anybody feels like uh, they cannot adhere to the rule and wishes to uh, uh, submit a reasonable accommodation request, uh, they're more than welcome to do that as long as they follow the proper procedures and submit all the required documentation uh, to the public housing authority to make a, an informed decision. And that is all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you uh, to all three of you for providing such uh, helpful information. So now we will turn it over to Eric Oberdorfer from NARO to talk about implementation. Thank the Public Health Law Center for putting on this uh, webinar today, as well as the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium and, and HUD for participating as well. Uh, my name is Eric Oberdorfer, and I work for the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're a membership organization that represents public housing agencies and community redevelopment groups across the country. Uh, and with the number of public housing agencies that we represent, clearly this is a role that we've been paying close attention to and working with uh, our members on. Um, so after, we, you know, now that we've learned a little bit about what the rule entails, I kind of wanted to go through what that implementation might look like for PHAs. And I really wanted to focus on some of the best practices that we've learned from our members uh, who have already undergone voluntary smoke-free policies. Um, and really to do that, there are a couple of things to remember. I kind of call it the checklist going through this. Uh, and it's introduce, inform, get input, update, accommodate, enforce, and promote. And so we'll go more into detail on each of these, but what's important to remember is that you need to introduce the idea of having a smoke-free policy to all of your residents, and you need to do that early on within the process so no one's caught uh, unaware, everyone's on the same page moving forward. You want to inform them of what the requirements are that HUD's put forth, because there are some very specific things that your policy has to entail. But at the same time, as Leroy mentioned, there are some flexibilities included within this. Um, and so you want to get input from your residents to get a better sense of, of what they think a smoke-free policy would look like and what that policy, how that policy might function in a way that would best benefit the, the public housing units that you're serving. You also want to make sure to update all of your leases, um, the PHA plan, and any sort of house rules that you might have posted just to make sure that residents are aware of this. And you want to accommodate people that are currently smokers, people that are actually going to be the ones mostly impacted by this uh, new policy going forward. You need to make sure you enforce your smoke-free policy, but at the same time, it's also going to be critical to continue to promote the smoke-free policy moving forward so that it becomes very much second nature to the residents of any public housing unit. So one of the things we've learned uh, in the very, very early stages in this, uh, and if there are any public housing agencies listening today that have not started moving forward with their smoke-free plans, we highly encourage doing that as soon as possible. Um, but one of the things that, that can be really beneficial is to survey the residents that live in all of your public housing developments. And what this is going to do is really serve two purposes. The first is that it's going to give you a better sense of the demographics of your public housing, um, both in terms of the number of families living there and things you might already know, but also who might be a smoker, who's not a smoker, what people are really, you know, maybe against having smoking bans put into place and what people are really for it. Um, this can be really helpful in that it gives you a sense of what potential level of uh, opposition you might face with your residents moving forward, but it also identifies people that can act as champions within 
uh, your public housing units to kind of work with their neighbors and other residents to understand the benefits of having a smoke-free policy. The other thing that the survey does, especially when you do it early on, is it alerts residents of the upcoming changes that will come with the smoke-free policy. So again, the earlier they know, the better off everyone will be because then it's not gonna be a surprise and there's gonna be more buy-in from the community. And as uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Castro Ramirez mentioned earlier, that's a really critical step in making sure you have a successful policy. It's also important to set a time frame for the change very early on. This is less of a concern now that the final rule is actually in place because once the effective date hits on February 3rd, PHAs will have to have those smoke-free policies in place by uh, August 2018, which is gonna be 18 months from the effective date. This was a little more important when these were, when PHAs were putting in voluntary policies just to make sure that they weren't going through the process of developing the policy for months and months. But you wanna make sure the residents know that. So again, uh, they know what the target date is, they know what to expect and when to expect it. And this also gives you a chance to let them know that there are gonna be meetings and other opportunities to discuss what a smoke-free policy might look like, but also to allow the PHA to get input from the residents on any sort of policy moving forward. It's important to plan multiple meetings uh, in the beginning well in advance, and the reason that you wanna do this is because you wanna make sure you have high attendance. If you just have one meeting to kind of talk about what HUD's requirements are and what potential flexibilities you can have, there might be a lot of people that are, that are residents that miss out on that opportunity to come and provide input. And it's really important to receive input from all of your residents, both including uh, residents that are in support of having smoking bans within all of the public housing units and residents that are against it. And it's also really important to make sure that you're receiving that input at the same time. I think what that does is it really gives residents a better sense of what their neighbors might be thinking and feeling in regard to a smoke-free policy. Uh, you know, for example, if you had a meeting and only individuals that were opposed to having a ban on smoking within their units came, to them it would seem very much like, well, no one in our uh, development wants this. Why are we moving forward? This doesn't make sense. But there could be you know, half of the, the residents of that development that just didn't come to that meeting that actually are in support of this. So it's important to have both sides and it's important for both sides to see the other side as well moving forward because that's gonna help legitimize the process and it's gonna help increase the buy-in that residents have. So you wanna make sure whatever policy you have is something that they actually will follow and that they have that buy-in to. The other thing that these meetings does is it, it provides an opportunity to explain HUD's rationale in mandating smoke-free policies. So oftentimes, you know, what we'll hear from our members is that either residents or even staff at public housing agencies feel like Washington, D.C. might be telling them that they have to do this thing, but it might not make sense in their community and so on. But as, as Lourdes and uh, Leroy and Peter discussed earlier, you know, there are real reasons why smoke-free policies are important and there are real tangible benefits that come from it. So having these meetings provides a really good opportunity to discuss what those are to the residents and kind of give them a better sense of, of you know, why this process is moving forward. And the other thing too is that it allows the residents to discuss the positives of smoke-free policies, especially to those who might be against a ban. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes people don't realize that them smoking a cigarette in a unit actually does impact their neighbors. You know, you could say, well, it's in my home, I don't see why it's a big deal to you, but it does go through the walls, it goes into the hallways, uh, and all of those things that were mentioned before. So this provides an opportunity to kind of suss some of that out and get the residents to really understand where this is coming from. The other thing, too, that's important to remember is that this policy impacts the residents but it also impacts the staff of the public housing agency as well because no one is able to smoke there and they all have to follow the same rules when they're on that property. So I think that's something important to stress too, that it's not just something impacting the residents, it's an overall uh, rule, it's an overall policy that's gonna impact everyone. The other thing that the meetings are good for is it'll help inform the residents, again, of these policies early on and give an opportunity to kind of talk through what other public housing agencies have done uh, just so they get a better sense of potential options that they have. And again, that's gonna really work to reduce the surprise element that 
that might happen if you don't have these meetings in advance and early on. And again, it's a good opportunity to inform residents of the benefits of uh, these policies. So once you've gone through that process of informing the residents that this smoke-free policy is coming, that you've gotten input from them to kind of figure out what the best way to move forward is, and you're in the process of drafting the policy itself, you need to remember to include these policies in the PHA plan and any lease that's signed by someone moving into one of the public housing units, but also within your house rules. And I think one of the most important things about this, and again, this is why it's important to start this process as early as possible, is that you need to ensure you have enough time to update your PHA plan. Uh, sometimes snags happen, sometimes um, things don't move as quickly as, I was, uh, as you would expect, either because of the board or some other approval process. So you want to make sure you have a cushion so that your PHA plan can be approved and updated by the time uh, this implementation date occurs in August of 2018. The other thing to note is that there is a lot of sample smoke-free language that's out there. Um, this includes public housing agencies that have already put in voluntary smoke-free uh, or smoke-free policies, but also HUD has a bunch of resources as well online that were mentioned earlier that can kind of help walk through what this provision in a lease might look like. Um, one of the things I want to point out, though, that's important to remember is that if you do have specific provisions that are unique to your policy, things that uh, kind of come from that flexibility that's a part of the smoke-free final rule, uh, it's important to make sure that that's included in there as well. You don't just want to copy verbatim if you've kind of gone a different way uh, using some of those flexibilities. The other thing that's important to do is make sure that it's included in the language within the house rules. Uh, this really helps to make residents aware of the new policy and the changes that uh, are going to occur to existing leases, but also it's really important too because something to remember is that if a resident has a guest over and that guest smokes, they're still going to be responsible for that. So it, it, it's a good reminder to the residents not only that this is going to impact them, but anyone they have come over and visit that's also going to hold true, the smoke-free policy is going to hold true for them as well. So if you have a guest and they go out and, and they're not smoking in the right area or something, you know, that can be detrimental to the resident themselves. So it's important to make sure that, you know, there's signs up with language saying no smoking or this is the smoking area or whatever it might be. Uh, and again, if there is smoking that's allowed on a specific part of the property, again, it's really critical to make sure there's good signage uh, and that there's language in the house rules notifying people where those areas are. That way, the more clarity there is, the less confusion there will be, which means that people will kind of understand where they're supposed to go and how that's supposed to work. So it's also important to remember that the smoke-free policy is not necessarily um, prohibiting people who live in public housing from smoking. You know, a lot of times you'll have individuals that say, I'm an adult, it's my right to do what I want, um, you know, I'm going to keep smoking, that's all there is to it. And, and that's not what this rule is about. It's just about making sure that other residents of public housing are safe from secondhand smoke. So if your policy does allow for outdoor smoking, then it's advisable to assign smoking areas for residents and visitors and an, an easy to find place, something that's clearly marked, uh, because that's going to, you know, help, help them understand where it is that they're supposed to go. And, and it also lets them know that, you know, it's not that we're telling you you can't smoke. It's not that we're trying to prohibit you from any sort of behavior. It's just more for the health of our residents that are not smokers. Something that's been really interesting, though, that we've heard from some of our members is that you want to try to avoid creating smoking areas that kind of encourage residents to congregate for long periods of time. So uh, one example came from one of our members where they had a bunch of nice benches out. It, it was kind of this nice little area to go and sit. And essentially what would happen, it was a, a public housing development specifically for older individuals. And a lot of them would go and congregate in these areas and stay there all day and hang out. But then you had other members of the public housing agent uh, uh, who lived within that public housing development that felt left out, that felt they couldn't come and join that group because they weren't smokers. 
Uh, and sometimes it's gonna be even more critical, especially if you have an individual who has an oxygen tank or something where they really can't uh, expose themselves to that. So th it's something to keep in mind. You wanna have an area to accommodate smokers to go to, but ideally you want them to go to that area, smoke their cigarette, but then come back. They, you don't want people to stay there. Um, the other way you can accommodate smokers too, and this was touched on earlier as well, is, is to encourage smoking cessation. There are a lot of people who have been smoking their whole lives who would like to quit but have just never found the opportunity to do so. This could be something that incentivizes them to do that. Um, and a way to accommodate that is to make sure that you provide them with cessation resources to assist them. So this doesn't necessarily mean that staff of the public housing agency are responsible for going through these. Uh, but as mentioned before, um, there are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of community organizations that you can get in touch with and partner with to help uh, create, those, um, create those partnerships to encourage smoking cessation with your residents. And this could even include having um, someone from another organization come and utilize community space within the development to have people uh, meet with them, or it could be just making sure that your resident is aware that these organizations exist. So there's a lot of ways to go about doing that. So since this is a federal regulation, there is a requirement to enforce the policy. Um, you know, before this became an actual regulation, we've heard how a lot of our members with voluntary smoke-free policies had kind of gone about doing this. Um, but one of the things that they all noted was that for the most part, these smoking policies have been largely self-enforcing. And this is especially true if you start at the beginning and make sure there's that buy-in um, from the very get-go. So a lot of times if a neighbor realizes that one of their other neighbors is smoking in an area that they're not supposed to, they might just approach them and let them know that that's not the correct area. Sometimes it's that they might smell smoke coming out of someone's unit. Uh, and they'll report that to staff at the PHA, which then lets the staff kind of begin the process of, of inquiring as to whether or not that resident was smoking in the unit. But uh, again, and as this was mentioned, you know, it, it's really critical to avoid eviction when possible. There needs to be consequences and there needs to be some sort of teeth to this policy or there'd be no reason for people to follow it. Um, but again, you can do that through a very graduated process, uh, like I believe Leroy was mentioning through verbal warnings, written warnings, and so on. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard from our members who have tried to actually, who have gotten to the point where they've deemed there were enough lease violations that they wanted to evict uh, a tenant, they would go through the grievance procedure and actually be told by a judge that that wasn't deemed sufficient enough to evict someone. So, it, it, you know, you want to avoid that as much as possible. You want to avoid that whole process. But again, when the violation occurs, and this was mentioned earlier too, it's really critical to remind the residents about the merits of smoke-free housing. So again, reminding them why this policy is in place in the first place. And it's, it's there to protect residents from secondhand smoke, to reduce the danger of fires, and also to reduce maintenance and cleaning costs. So it's not about necessarily telling someone they can't smoke in their unit. It's about their residents and making sure that the uh, health and safety of the residents is, is as high as can possibly be. So lastly, promoting smoke-free policies is important. You don't wanna go through this whole process, implement something, and then kind of just forget about it and not remind residents of it. Um, you know, it's important to remember that you'll have new tenants coming in that might be unfamiliar with the smoke-free policy. You have to continually make sure that anyone who is within that development is aware of what that policy is. Uh, and there are ways to do this. You can do regular updates using announcements and postings in common areas throughout the development. Uh, you can even address letters and mail them to leaseholders just as reminders that this policy is in place, reminders as to why the policy is there. You can put flyers and notices on bulletin boards and newsletters, again, posted in the common areas. And having proper signage just around the development, you know, with a no smoking sign in areas that you can't, and then a clear indicator where a smoking area is if your policy allows for a smoking area. That kind of action really helps as constant reminders for your residents of what that policy is and, and what's allowed and what's not. So that's something, even once this is implemented and even once the policy is in place, to continue to do moving forward if you want to make sure that it, it remains successful. And 
with that, those were just a couple of the best practices that we learned from our members, and I will pass it back to uh, Mike. But before I do, I just want to make sure my email address is up here. Uh, please feel free to contact me with any questions. Uh, if there are any PHAs listening that either want, um, you know, to make contact with another PHA that has a smoke-free policy already in place or to get language on what can go in leases, I'm more than happy to help and make those connections. So uh, please feel free to contact me if you need to. And with that, I'll pass it back to Mike. Thank you, Eric. Um, and just so people know, too, these slides will be made available after the webinar. So um, I know this, this slide, for example, with Eric's contact information will be uh, will be available, so anyone is uh, welcome to contact him that way. So I'm just going to talk briefly about how public housing authorities can go beyond the requirements of the HUD rule. Um, Ms. Castro-Ramirez mentioned that the HUD rule sets out only the minimum requirements for public housing authority smoke-free policies. PHAs are allowed to adopt smoke-free policies that go even further to protect the health of the residents, and many public housing authorities have already done this. So there are two main ways that PHAs can go beyond the requirements of the rule. So first, they can include electronic cigarettes in the smoke-free provisions. Um, Ms. Castro-Ramirez mentioned that the smoke-free provisions include only prohibited tobacco products, uh, which is products that are lighted, such as conventional cigarettes, cigars, and pipes, uh, as well as hookah pipes. This does not include products that heat a solution and emit an aerosol, such as e-cigarettes. Now, there are several reasons you may want to consider including e-cigarettes in a smoke-free policy for a public housing authority. Uh, first, there are possible enforcement, there's possible enforcement confusion caused by allowing e-cigarettes in locations where smoking is prohibited. Some of these products, uh, some of the e-cigarettes physically resemble conventional cigarettes, and people may think that smoking is allowed if they see e-cigarettes being used. Um, but beyond that, there is emerging science about the harmful effects of the aerosol emitted by e-cigarettes, and use of the products may normalize tobacco or nicotine use among young residents of public housing authorities. The Surgeon General just came out with a report on health effects of e-cigarettes last week, and I would encourage people to review that. Um, the second way public housing authorities can in go beyond the requirements of the rule to protect public health would be to include more outdoor areas in the smoke-free provisions. Um, they can, in fact, declare the entire property to be smoke-free. Uh, the rule does apply to outdoor areas that are 25 feet away from indoor areas where smoking is prohibited, but this can leave many areas not covered, such as outdoor swimming pools or playgrounds. Including these areas in the smoke-free provisions can ensure that children are protected from secondhand smoke and that tobacco use is not renormalized. Uh, there may be enforcement challenges to setting up smoking areas on the property, and those would be eliminated if the entire property is simply declared smoke-free. Um, before going to questions and answers, I wanted to let you know about some resources uh, that we here at the Public Health Law Center have related to the HUD rule. And these can be found on our website, www.publichealthlawcenter.org. Uh, first, an archive recording of this webinar along with the slides will be there. Um, we also have a general fact sheet describing what's in the rule, and that's the document you see in blue on the left on this slide. Uh, we will have other fact sheets on topics related to the HUD rule, including reasonable accommodations, uh, that should be available on our website shortly. Uh, we have other documents, like the one on the right, uh, that is a model smoke-free lease addendum. Now, this addendum isn't designed specifically for public housing authorities to comply with the HUD rule, but it is a comprehensive policy that includes e-cigarettes and outdoor areas, and it would be compliant, compliance with the requirements of the HUD rule, so I wanted you to be aware of it. We also have a model smoke-free house rules policy that contains the same requirements um, if a house rules policy is the preferred route to adopt a policy. Um, Eric mentioned you can use sample smoke-free language. I know his organization um, has access to some, and this is oh, another example here of one you could use, and I know there are many others out there. So with that, um, I'd, like to turn to, um, I'd like to go to a question and answer session. Um, we've had uh, several uh, questions come in here. We might go a little bit past the hour, but um, I, will, uh, I will try to get to as many of these as I can um, while respecting the, the valuable time of our presenters here. So first, uh, we got a question from Sarah Brokenleg. Sarah, I hope you're doing well. Um, how will the rule affect tribes and urban American Indian housing uh, like Little Earth in Minneapolis? I think this might be a good question for one of the HUD speakers to tackle. 
Yeah, uh, this is Leroy Ferguson from Public Housing. Uh, the rule does not apply to tribal uh, agencies. Okay, very, that's very quick. We should get through these quickly at this rate. Um, and uh, I'll slow it down a little bit. <laughs> this is Peter Ashley. Uh, we know some um, tribal housing entities have adopted smoke-free policies, and, uh, and, and we're going to work, uh, my office, uh, we plan on working with our Office of Public Housing to, uh, to definitely outreach to, uh, to tribes to uh, encourage more to, to adopt policies. So we definitely welcome uh, two suggestions on how best to do this. Thanks. Sure. I should mention, too, if I throw a question to one speaker, but the, if the other speaker, Eric, if you have anything to add on that, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, I am going to toss the next question to you, though, just as a warning. <laughs> um, so, Eric, um, you said that eviction, that you said that people should avoid eviction when possible, um, but that the policy will need teeth to be effective. Um, what steps short of eviction would you recommend for first or second offenses, and uh, at what point should eviction be considered? Yeah, so usually what we've kind of heard works is when you do a graduated process like this, usually you start with a written warning. Um, sometimes we know of some public housing agencies that do up to three of those uh, before going into a verbal warning where you kind of have to come in, have a meeting with staff to discuss the policy and what's, got, what's happened. Um, even from there, you can move it to another step where you do potentially counseling um, with someone to kind of walk through why this is happening to figure out a way to to make sure that it that it doesn't continue. And usually for public housing agencies, they have, especially since these are considered lease violations, there's some policy that they have that they kind of work through this. Um, typically, you know, most public housing agencies don't want to evict someone for the first strike or second strike where something happens, especially if it's something that's, you know, something, I don't want to say smaller, but, you know, not as, as dangerous to other individuals as, as you know, potential uh, other safety concerns might be. So there are ways to kind of work with your residents through this process, but, you know, eventually you get to a point if you've done, say, five different steps throughout this process and nothing's changed that you have to kind of ask yourself, well, has this been enough of a lease violation that we need to move forward with a grievance procedure uh, in terms of an eviction? So there are ways to do it, and it, it's really going to depend upon each individual PHA and how they move forward with that. But really, you know, it's, it's going to be a harder sell to evict someone on a first strike for smoking in their unit if you have to go to a judge to kind of back that up. That's, it's especially, you know, it seems a little, uh, it seems a little drastic for, for the offense. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, I have another, well, actually, I have two questions that are kind of coming at the same issue from uh, opposite directions. I think I might just combine them here. I think uh, these might be good questions for uh, the HUD representatives, but Eric, feel free to jump in if you like. Um, one question, uh, Annie Peterson asked, mentioned that the House Freedom Caucus has expressed concerns uh, with the rule. Um, she is wondering if it's possible that the rule might be overturned. So, I mean, obviously you can't, I know you can't speak to specific things that might occur in a political setting, but I'm just wondering maybe you could speak about the process in place regarding revisiting the rules. But then from the opposite end, there's a question, um, somebody is wondering if there is, a, if there is a way for public health advocates to contact anyone at HUD just to voice their support for the rule um, to make sure it's on the record to help ensure that the rule stays in place. Apologize for a compound question there. Sure. Uh, this is Peter Ashley. Um, I, I can't say uh, very much about um, the chances of the rule being revoked. Um, I, I know I, I've seen a, uh, information that over uh, the, that caucus has uh, targeted over 200 rules uh, to be revoked, and um, so I guess we're in good company. But um, uh, you know, it, it hopefully it's not going to happen. Uh, I know we've we received a lot of support uh, during the comment period um, for the proposed rule, and um, I think rather than sending HUD your uh, your communications on supporting the rule, probably your elected officials uh, would be, uh, you know, be most appropriate to uh, contact them, uh, your congressional delegation, um, 
in, within your states and, and I'll let them know. Uh, but certainly we hope that uh, the rule stays in place. I don't know if um, my colleagues in public housing have any comments. No comments, Pete. We're in agreement with you. Yeah, as are we. We, we, we have done a lot of great work on this, and we certainly hope it stays in place. Um, one more uh, question for HUD here. Um, this is from Kara Scan. Kara, hope you're doing well. Um, is there a timeline for the release of HUD's implementation support materials? Hi, this is Marquita Sanders. Um, I also work in uh, PIH at HUD. Um, I am sort of the lead working on a number of materials. So we're expecting um, a number of materials to actually be finished and up for distribution at the end of January before the February 3rd um, timeline. So uh, we want to make sure that folks are checking out the Healthy Homes website because a lot of that information will be posted there as well as um, sent out via email from both Healthy Homes and um, PIH through its, um, uh, through its uh, website. Uh, thank you. And actually, Kara had a second question as long as I'm uh, asking hers. She asked, she mentioned that HUD, the HUD rule says that signage must be accessible and in multiple language. How will a public housing authority know if signage is compliant? Uh, this is Leo. I can answer that question. Well, public housing authorities are aware of what the language barriers are for each specific, you know, public housing authority. Uh, so, again, they will have discretion uh, when developing the signage. Uh, so, you know, uh, if there is a heavy populated uh, Spanish population, then uh, the Public Housing Authority would more than likely have those signs uh, translated into uh, English and Spanish for those uh, who don't speak English as a primary language. Thank you. Um, I have a question for, um, for Eric. Um, if a Public Housing Authority has a smoke-free policy in place, um, who can they contact to make sure it complies with the HUD rule? You sort of mentioned, talked a little bit about this at the end of your portion of the presentation. I know you mentioned, I think, NARO could connect people um, or work on it themselves. Yeah, well, um, I mean, NARO would be happy to connect PHAs with other PHAs just to kind of go through how to implement it. Um, to be honest, the final rule is pretty simple, there's not a whole lot to it, so making sure that you kind of check all those boxes shouldn't be too challenging, but, and I, you know, I could pass this to uh, my friends over at HUD, but I would think one of the best things to do would be to contact your field office just to make sure that, that they think the language that you have kind of checks those boxes if you wanted uh, someone to verify for you. Sure, That's and I should admit, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is Leo. That is correct. You would have to contact the field office if a public housing authority was not in compliance. I should mention too, we here at the uh, at the Public Health Law Center would be happy to review it as well. Um, maybe, Peter, I think you talked about this a little bit, but um, Sally Herndon, hi Sally, has a que uh, had a question too. I mean, um, it's kind of reiterating what I said before, but just. For clarifications, I know you mentioned that to express support for the rule, people it, the better route might be for elected to contact elected officials. But she, uh, Sally, mentions that this new rule is a very welcome step in protecting folks from secondhand smoke. Is there a process to thank HUD formally in order to make sure the rule sticks in a policy environment that may become more anti-regulation? I don't know if you had anything to follow up, um, but I did want to I did want to highlight Sally's question as well. Uh, well, that's a good question. I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess there's always uh, local uh, editorials for your, your local newspapers uh, and online um, ways to do that online as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure Secretary Castro and the administration would, uh, would love to hear from you if, um, if you want to, um, you know, show your, your support uh, for the rule. So just sure. a few ideas. And, yeah, uh, and this is Eric, too. Sure. It, it might be worthwhile once, you know, the new administration kind of comes in into office and, and there are more political appointees at HUD with the new administration, figure out who they are and, and potentially write them letters, you know, in support of this and let them know that this is something mm -hmm. you support. That might be helpful as well, especially with people coming in who weren't here through these last eight years kind of moving this forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question, I think this is a pretty, the answer to this one will be pretty quick, um, from Peggy Toy. What about marijuana smoke addressed in the rules? 
No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah marijuana, is, marijuana is still a controlled substance, and it's not allowed in public housing. But but the rule itself only speaks to uh, only speaks to tobacco smoking and uh, and and so the but the but existing federal law is in place regarding marijuana being a a, fed, a controlled substance. That is correct. Uh, yeah. Um, there was a question. Um, just this might just be helpful for clarification purposes. Um, somebody heard a reference to there being uh, sort of. Case by case, she said. Uh, I think she, uh, she she referenced that. Said, when might there be an exemption? Um, it sounds it sounds like uh, it, it sounds like she's asking when it's possible for, to allow somebody to smoke indoors. And if you could just clarify whether or not that is something that's allowed, I think that would be helpful. Uh, this is Leroy again. I don't. I'm not sure uh, if that will actually be the case. Again, you know, once we go to no smoking. Uh, it may be may be difficult for a a reasonable accommodation request to come in and, and ask for um, you know accommodation to smoke. Uh, again, that will be determined on a case by case basis. Uh, I can't say there will be an exception any exemptions to that. Uh, but again, you know, if a resident feels that strongly that uh, they have to smoke and have the documentation, then again, they can submit that on a case by case basis. Uh, that's how those requests would be considered to the public housing authority for uh, review and uh, approval or disapproval. Thanks. I mean, from what I've heard, the example that's often given is uh, that, you know, a reasonable accommodation might be to move a smoker from the second floor to the first floor if they have mobility issues and, and uh, you know, need to be able to get outside more easily, although that could apply, I suppose, in just to any person, you know, regardless of, you know, for any reason for them to go outside. I mean, that's, would you say that that's kind of an example of something that might, that might happen? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, thank you. There was a question um, about whether HUD will provide funding for apartment rehabilitation to get rid of the smell of smoke. They pointed out that that can be an expensive process. Uh, we already provide funding to public housing authorities through uh, capital funds and operating funds uh, to maintain public housing units. Uh, so they will always they, they already get that money uh, to maintain those units. Uh, capital funding is used for more bigger expenses, and operating funds are used for the daily expenses. Uh, so again, public housing authorities do receive funding to maintain public housing properties. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a question that came in. I think I'm, this might be the last question here um, from Kristen Hernandez. Are there devoted HUD field staff devoted to aiding in the implementation of the smoke-free rule? I know you talked about that a bit, but if you have any clarification or um, additional information, that would be helpful. Um, so this is Marquita Sanders again. Um, I can't necessarily speak for Healthy Homes. Um, we're both in the process of developing. Um, education for staff to better assist PHAs on the ground. There won't be um, a field staff in each office that will be dedicated to uh, doing training on um, smoke-free, but uh, we're working to develop an ambassador program to have dedicated people in the field generally um, to help with that process, separate from working with our um, partners like Healthy Homes, CDC, and others to um, help support PHAs in that process. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the uh, I just wanted to add we have um the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes have I believe it's eight uh, field staff and a lot of them um have a lot have quite a bit of experience promoting smoke free policies over the years. Um, you know, helping to get sessions together at uh, NARO uh, regional conferences, et cetera. And uh we we'd like to work with um, the Office of Public Housing and and have them um, gain the knowledge needed to to help with uh, you know rural implementation. So I think they would be a great resource for that. Sure. Um, Eric, did you have anything to add on the just on the resources that Narrow can provide as well? Just want to give you an opportunity there too. Yeah, uh, we're especially uh, when it comes to implementing this from the public housing side, we're more than happy happy to help answer any questions. Um, a lot of what we can do is point people to resources. There are a lot of them out there, and, and HUD's done a really good job kind of getting those together. Um, but yeah, we're more than happy to to help where we can. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to the speakers um, on this webinar, Lourdes Castro Ramirez, Peter Ashley, Leroy Ferguson, Eric Oberdorfer. I really appreciate uh, you devoting your time uh, to speak to to speak here to the public health community. Um, I think this is a really exciting rule. Um, look forward to look forward to it being implemented, um, and I appreciate all the work all of you are doing on this. So. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if anybody has any questions remaining, you know, feel free to follow up with an email. Uh, the webinar will be on our website as well as the slides. And uh, really appreciate the attendees being here and the presenters presenting. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike.